I am very happy to be here with you all, and I am introducing the SEEK panel. I'm the clinical professor of SEEK and Jane studies here at Loyola Marymount University. Um, we have classes where students get to do engaged learning. They go to seek gurdwaras. They go to the Jain temple. They do, um, we do meditation in every class um, session. We, um, students choose a 40-day practice that they do, um, whether it's meditation or yoga or practicing a parigraha or a himsa and, or seva. Um, and it's been wonderful to be here at LMU because it is an institution um, based on Ignatian spirituality that recognizes God in all things. And I was raised in the 3HO Sikh community with Yogi Bhajan, um, Siri Singh Sab Bhai Sab, Her Bhajan Singh Khalsa Yogi Ji. And he, um, he always taught us that if you can't see God in all, you can't see God at all. And um, we were raised, I was, you know, when I was born in the Tucson ashram, um, this was a place where they had um, a super health program for treating people that had addictions, and they used yoga, meditation, herbs, um, and Ayurvedic um, foods um, to help us, to help people maintain a healthy diet. When I was born, my mother would massage me with almond oil, um, I was, when I was, uh, after I had my daughters, I was fed yogurt curry and, um, and given an almond drink with dates and ghee. And um, when I, um, one of my favorite comfort foods is mung beans and rice with the trinity roots of <laughs> garlic and ginger. Um, and onions, and um, we very much, it was just part of my life. And so I've been so happy that I can be here to learn from you all um, at this Ayurveda conference because I realized how much it's been incorporated into my everyday world um, without even fully recognizing it. Um, and so Yogi Bhajan also um, gave us Yogi Tea. Uh, it's a wonderful warm drink with um, cardamom and cinnamon and licorice um, and ginger. And this is something that you, when you go into any 3HO Sikh household, you smell the aroma of yogi tea wafting out when you go there. And, and they created a whole business. If you ever buy yogi tea at the store, this is <laughs> from that. And so we have two wonderful panelists today. Um, Karta Pudik Singh will be speaking second, and he actually has worked with Yogi Tea and helped them with their Ayurvedic um, herbs and ingredients. And uh, Shanti, Kar, Shanti Shantikar is going to be speaking first. The Sikh tradition has, does have a tradition related to Ayurveda. Within the Udasi and Mahant sects um, of the Sikh tradition, they would practice Ayurveda, they would comment on Ayurveda. So it may have a different, their roots um, may come also, or the texts that they use may come from different traditions, but it's been a part of the Sikh tradition as well. The seventh Guru, Guru Harai, he also had a Naulaka garden, a Naulaka bog in Kiratpur, where he would grow all of the medicinal herbs and heal people. And there's a story of um, Dara Shiko, the son of Shah Jahan, the emperor of India, when he was poisoned with tiger's whiskers by his own brother, Arangzeb. The royal family begged for the medicinal herbs from, the, from Guru Harai's medicinal garden. And um, they included cloves, 100 grams of harar, known in the Ayurvedic medicine as aralu, and credited um, with laxative properties. He mixed these ingredients with a pearl called jagmoti, which was to be ground and used as a subsidiary remedy. Then when the son was healed, the emperor was pleased and um, vowed that he would never again um, cause enmity with the Sikh community. So there's been an interesting connection, and, and now we have our Sikh panel. And I would like to first introduce Shanti Shantikar. Uh, she is the founder and director of the Guru Ramdas Center for Medicine and Humanology, a yoga instructor since 1971. She specializes in kundalini yoga and meditation and shares this with people with chronic and life-threatening illnesses. 
she has studied directly under Yogi Bhajan, and um, this center also provides services for people with diabetes, cancer, heart disease, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, HIV anxiety, and depression. She is a charter member of the International Association of Yoga Therapists, and she provides training to health professionals and yoga instructors and yoga and meditation to the spiritual, psychological, and behavioral aspects of getting and staving, staying well. Her talk today, The Living Vitality of Your Authentic Self, addresses the needs of both the healer and the one that's being healed. Thank you. For the, you're, you're in charge of this, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome everyone while we're working out the details. It's always a treasure to come to conferences to be a participant because it's a chance to connect with old friends and to meet new ones. For here, how many people, by show of hands, are clinicians. You work with people who have some type of health condition. They come to see you for yoga therapy or for Arveda. So a few of you, okay. And then those who are the ones who go, both of these will um, be benefited from what we're talking about today. Um, but the main audience or the main focal point is for people who are uh, practitioners, people who are serving others through these methods. Uh, as Narinjikar mentioned, uh, my work is from the tradition of Yogi Bhajan, from Kulini Yoga, as taught by him, and I am also a Sikh. The, uh, when we start any of our practices, we always start with a mantra that helps us to tune in, to connect with the inner teacher, the divine guidance within. And so because we're going to be doing two meditations as part of our practice today, we will start by tuning in. And the, which is the button that goes next? This one? Yes. All right. So who here has ever taken a Kundalini Yoga class before? Okay, nice handful of you, okay. So you're probably familiar with this. So you can make the sound really confidently, and those who are doing it for the first time can kind of uh, feel the support from you as you're making the sound. The sound is, uh, we already had a very strong introduction with uh, the set power of mantra, the effect of sound current, and we'll be using that throughout this next uh, 20 minutes, the understanding of the impact that sound has in creating a physiological and energetic change. So this particular sound current is intended to help you feel your connection with your own inner guidance. And whenever people have a difficulty with their health, a sudden or catastrophic diagnosis, one of the first things that get, gets shaken is our self-confidence. People describe to me how they feel that their body has betrayed them, how they can't trust anything, they don't know what's happening next. And there's a lot of uncertainty around, you know, and a lot of decisions that need to be made, and sometimes with contradictory evidence or input. So we find that this sound current, even though it's originally intended to begin whenever we do any Kulini Yoga meditation or yoga practice, it has in itself a therapeutic value. We, we consider it like our first yoga therapy intervention is the capacity to slow down and connect within, and let the mind quiet and allow your own inner guidance to come through. So the way the sound is done, it's first is the sound of Aung. Most of us are familiar with Aum, A-U-M. Aung, O-N-G, is, takes that infinity of, of the Aum and brings it grounded into the finite, into the earth and into your own being. Nam. So Aung also just saying it's the uh, connection to the creativity uh, within the creation. Namo is uh, a, a recognize the presence of or I acknowledge. So Ong Namo is the first sound. 
Second is Guru Dev. Guru in the Western world, the word guru is so misunderstood. You, know, you hear this, the guru of Wall Street tells us this and this, as if that's the person who give, bestows wisdom on you, when actually guru is that which brings light to your own misunderstanding. It brings clarity. It's your own inner guidance. It's your teacher within. It's not some author external authority figure. So when we say Gurudev, we're saying, I'm acknowledging my unseen presence of teacher, my hidden uh, angel of the wisdom that's within me, and Namo. So it's Gurudev Namo. Now, we talk about what the words mean, but the impact of mantra doesn't come from its translation. It comes from the application of the frequency of that sound. And so the way we make the sound, you'll feel it yourself. We're in a mudra because sound current and prana are carried through mudra, just like they're carried through asana or eye focus. So we'll have the mudra where your palms are together. And they're placed at the center of the chest. And if you want to keep your eyes open to see the words, you're welcome to do that. The sound ong, I'd like you to keep your mudra because as you hold the posture, you're going to notice perhaps that there's a change in your breath just by holding this position. The sound of ong is made, the breath is from the belly, and you bring it up and out, and you let your jaw relax and let the sound come through, and it'll resonate it'll, in your cranium as if you were blowing a conch cell. So you'll feel it, and your nose will start to tickle a little bit, your, upper, your tongue is moved up against your upper palate for the NG sound, and then it's right in position for the Namo. So that's the first part. Second part is Gurudev. It's on a, you can do a half breath in, in between. And it's, Guru is short, and Dev is like, so it's Gurudev, we kind of like shoot it up, and then Namo. So we'll do it once so you can hear it, and then we'll together do it three times. Start with an exhalation. So you got some room in there to bring your breath in. Let yourself just gently fill, and we'll begin. Oh. So that was your warm up. We'll do it three more times. Om Just let your breath find its own natural rhythm. Just notice how you feel. You can keep your hands in the mudra or you could relax them down. But just notice. When you're ready, you can gently open your eyes and let your hands relax. So what we're going to talk about now is um, what is, you know, we start out as our role as a yoga practitioner. Perhaps we practice yoga, we breathe, we go to class, maybe we do something at home. And then somehow we get this inspiration to become a yoga teacher and learn more in depth and be able to share this with other people. And at some point, we may get the calling, the inner longing to help 
people with yoga, and we become, we train, and we become a yoga therapist. And then the last phase is where you integrate your practice, your sharing as a teacher or an instructor, and your role as a therapist, and to experience yourself as a yogic healer. And actually, that's where we're going to put our attention on. It's the living vitality of your authentic self. What that means is that your very presence works. Your very presence through your practice creates an experience not only for yourself, but it transforms anyone who's within your own range. We just saw how far the aura can be expanded. That aura impacts other people. Just as we, other people's auras impact us, ours impact others. And it's the quality of your presence that gives your uh, self your authentic authenticity and your capacity to just be with people in a way that's therapeutic. It's wonderful that we learn and we know stuff and we know which herb does what and which breath can do that and what mantra, whatever. And all those techniques and tools are useful and important. And I want to emphasize that actually your presence makes a difference. How you are in the presence of suffering, how you are when someone is making, having great difficulty in making a choice or a transition. Your capacity to be in your own depth and from that still point to be into your expansion and the quality that your energy field has, has an impact. And I have to tell you, when you practice uh, uh, intentionally developing this, it makes your work a whole lot easier and also more effective. You work less, right? You work less harder. So what we're going to do with, we want to understand that uh, first in taking care of ourselves, when we, we are dealing with people at the most difficult time in their life, when they have, most people do not, their first step when they get a diagnosis is not coming to a yoga therapist. It's not coming to an Ayurvedic practitioner, not yet. So by the time someone comes into your presence to work with you, they've already tried many things and maybe have felt nothing's worked. There might be in a sense of uh, coming to you as a last effort, uh, maybe some thirst thread of hope that you can make some difference for them when everything else has not really gotten them where they needed to go. So you're already working with someone whose energy field is, is challenged. We also, in our, in our work, we recommend that you include friends and family in your uh, sessions with, with the, your client so that they can have someone to practice with. They can have someone who understands what they're doing that um, they don't have to explain it to because you've already done that. It provides a certain level of comfort and support. So what we're aiming for in terms of developing your capacity, not just in order to serve and avoid burning out, but actually to thrive and feel more energized with every client that you see, to feel more of your vitality, your spirit. And we do this through the movement of prana. So when we talk about prana, we talk about that, that's your original source of energy. We talk about it with the idea that it has a rhythmic pulse. Your actual forming of your breath does, but so does the, the, the frequency of prana itself. And the yogic techniques that we use are really to uh, direct the flow of prana, to move it in areas that might have been blocked or um, have a low vitality or low energy to it, and to equalize so that you have your vitality consistent and strong. Does that sound like something you'd like to have? If you're a practitioner, it's true. Okay, I'd like to share with you as we move into this a formula that Yogi Bhajan gave me in 1986. I was already a yoga teacher for 15 years when this came. When I started to teach people who had chronic or life-threatening illness, in this case, this was the late 80s, and the HIV epidemic in Los Angeles County was humongous. 
And people started coming to class as a way of looking for something to help them. And we, because there was me no medical treatment at that time, and we didn't, I didn't know how to teach people who were ill. I only knew how to teach people who were healthy, but there they were. So Yogi Bhajan gave me this formula. He first taught that you don't teach to the diagnosis, you teach to the person with that diagnosis. So every interaction, your person is different, perhaps. But in that, there's a container or a structure. You access through breath, meaning your way in to the energy field of that person is through their breath. What that does, it awakens their prana, it awakens their shakti, it gives them a certain level of vitality to make change. Without that, change is, and they're just going to hear you tell them to do something and they're not going to do it. They're too tired to begin with. They're too hopeless to begin with. They have challenges to begin with. So our first intervention is to raise their vitality. And we do that through accessing through the breath. And whatever methods you know how to do to do that, go for it. That's the way in. Then the second, you take that extra that prana and you strengthen yourself through movement. In our practice of kundalini yoga, we have rhythmic targeted movement as part of the yoga itself. But there are many different ways from your, whatever tradition you're trained in that will help you to create a strength through a movement. So the person's got the prana awakened, you move them, that helps to eliminate um, any blocks, it helps to uh, distribute the prana more equally, and it creates a sense of self-efficacy, which is the belief that what I do makes a difference. Aha, so I have that. Now that I believe that, or I've had the experience of it, I might do something that's gonna help me make a difference. You, those who raise their hands who are practitioners, you ever have difficulty having people incorporate what you've taught them? Nobody has that problem, right? No, okay. All right, well, the, the, one of the solutions is to raise their vitality and have an, so the individual can have an experience themselves. Then we integrate through sound. And mantra is, the, is like the equalizer that allows both to elevate, to deepen and connect, and to expand. And it has its own physiological impact. Sound current does, breath does, movement does. And taken together, in Kulini Yoga we call it Kriya. You put this together and you have a completed action, an impact that happens. This brings you to your stillness, your still point. And it is in the stillness that your body's internal wisdom, its inner doctor, can do its best work. That's really where the healing state is. So what I'd like us to do in the time that we have left is to practice a breath with sound. It's a, um, a mantra with breathing. So we use two, and this particular technique has two parts. One is the punch shabad, which is five sounds. The uh, consonants of the s, t, n, m, and the a. Ah. So the sound is sa, ta, na, ma. That we're going to use that sound silently and create a rhythm of your breath as you use this. So your inhalation will be in four parts. We'll inhale, and each sniff is one sound, one syllable. Sa, ta, na, and ma. And in that breath rhythm, you're going to want to balance it out. It takes about three or four cycles before you get all your sniffs equal, but you can do that. You can allow that. What this sound current does, it balances your tattvas and your gunas. It works with the elements, and it works with the, or the qualities of the person. When you've got your elements and your qualities balanced and clear and strong, your body can get itself well. Most of the time it can do that. Your exhalation is one long breath. Just breathe it out through your nose. And you're mentally thinking, wahe guru. Guru we already heard. Wahe means like, wow. It's like the experience of your own divinity, your own ecstasy of that. It also, uh, so the satanama helps you to ground and to integrate. And the Wahe Guru, it's, all, it's a trikiti mantra, which means it balances the three gunas, but it also helps you to connect and expand. 
Okay. Ready? Here's what you do. <clears throat> your eyes are going to be lightly open, focused at the tip of your nose. You're going to be inhaling in four parts. Each part has that mental thought of a syllable of sa, ta, na, or ma. Your exhale is one long breath, wahiguru, and then we start again. Your mudra, your hands, are in your lap, so the right, the back of the right hand is resting in the palm of the left, and the thumb tips touch. It takes three minutes when your body's at rest for your circulation to go through. So we'll do this for three minutes so that you can have this sound current and this breath moving through you all together. So we start with an exhalation. And then we'll breathe in eight, four parts. Sa, ta, na, ma. Exhale in one long breath. Wahe Guru. Your sound is silent because you'll be breathing. So it's like this. And continue. This breath is for vitality and calm, the two most important ingredients when you're helping yourself to get well and any other thing in life. It creates an internal self-regulation of your brain, your endocrine system, your nervous system. We'll do this for three minutes, and your breath is at your own pace. Mentally, you're thinking, sa, ta, na, ma, wahe guru. These two, the punch shabad and the trikiti mantra, are a foundational sound currents within Kulini Yoga and within Sikh Dharma. So you have a chance to experience them now. You're halfway through. So wherever you are in your cycle, complete it so that you end with a four-part inhalation. And then together, exhale in one long breath. Together, inhale in one long breath. Let it go. And once again, just notice what you sense, how you feel, the quality of your thoughts, what's happening with the energy of your, in your body. And when you're ready, you can gently open your eyes. Satnam.